record. I'm going into the classroom right now and I'm going to project you my screen. So you're in a moment going to have a show me desktop. Today's topic is a continuation from last uh, lecture. Last lecture we started talking about Article 5 in the context obviously of Article 7. Why do I say obviously? Article 5 is the definition article but the definition has an outcome. The outcome is, and I'll put this on the board momentarily, the outcome is whether the source state, the loser state, the source state may tax the business income. Of course, what does business income constitute? We'll look at that later. We'll tax the business income. How do we calculate business income? We've looked at that before, but we'll look at that again the business income, whether the source state may tax the business income of the home office in a resident state. That is, may the loser state tax the business income of a home office parent company, if it was a subsidiary, but it's not, it's a home office, of the winner state's company, that is, the country of residence. My screen should start projecting to yours in a moment. I have a student view here also. Um, and I see myself in my student view, so I suppose you can also. The uh, Okay, so quickly, what are we talking about? How is the context? We have Article 5, we have Article 7. <coughs> correctly put forward, we've started teaching the definitions in respect of the treaties. We've obviously run through the parties that are, are subject to the, uh, or can take advantage of the treaty. Um, we've talked about LLCs, trusts, things like that, partnerships. Um, we talked about Article 4 residency for, uh, for about a week and a half. Um, but if we really look at how to teach a treaty correctly, Although the treaty is written, um, putting our definitions first up until Article 5 and then Article 6 onward, we have the substance of the treaty. What is the substance of the treaty? The substance of the treaty is the division of the jurisdiction to tax certain types of income. And then we get to the end of the treaty and we have some procedural mechanisms such as tax credits, uh, dispute resolution between the two states, information exchange, these procedural issues that come later. We're not going to deal with that till the very end of class. That's really Marshall Langer. Um, however, one way to teach treaties, the way, well, just another way to teach treaties is to um, start with the division of income. One has to talk about residence and source state, that is, winner and loser state. But, uh, but the definitions only have meaning, that is, their context can only be understood in relation to the division of the jurisdiction of taxing rights. So, what am I saying? Let's do a little picture on the board. And uh, we have our winner state, that is the state of residence. We have our loser state. So our resident state, R, and our loser state, S, source. We have an item of income. For purposes of our lecture today, that item of income is business income. Without getting into what business income means yet without getting into how one calculates business income. On the little journey today that we're going to take, I'm going to take you through the OECD, through Klaus Vogel, through an example of the U.S. English Tax Treaty, and so forth. You'll see those Actually, you don't see them. They're all open on my screen at the bottom, but when I project my screen, I see it's 
not projecting them out because I don't have fit to screen chosen. Yes, now I see them. Okay, so business income is really Article 7 of the treaty. Article 7 of the treaty being a substantive article, that is, a substantive article is an article that grants one state and or the other state the rights of taxation, that is really the rights to collect taxation, referring back to my previous lectures, that domestic rights are never eliminated by tax treaties, they are just suppressed. There's always a domestic jurisdictional right to impose taxation, the treaty suppresses the right to collect it. That's my opinion, that's not everybody's opinion. Um, so Article 7 allocates a dual jurisdiction to tax when income falls under Article 7. Article 7, business income article, only applies when there is a permanent establishment. Thus, we have Article 5 to define what a permanent establishment is. Now, we already talked two weeks ago about the basic definition of a permanent establishment, and I talked to you at that point about time being relevant, the spatial feature, meaning a, a place, and I showed you where to go further research and to study that terminology. You know that term's going to be on your exam. You know it's going to, there's going to be a case study on your exam. There always has been every single year for eight years deciphering permanent establishment. And you have plenty of course materials that approach it from different perspectives. Klaus Vogel has a very different perspective. Hale Stewart, is that a hint? <laughs> yes, Hale. Every single year, permanent establishment is tested through some kind of hypothetical case study to make sure that everyone not only can read the definition, that's an assumption that we, we make, but that you can actually apply the definition to, uh, to your case facts. The, um, and I hope your other teacher is getting into this. That's Alan DeCoker and, uh, and Dennis Kleinfeld supposed to come into class, but uh, I just don't think the, uh, the old guys get the mega meeting thing. Um, the, uh, I know Marshall Langer does get it, and I know he knows a lot about permanent establishments, and I know that he'll be back in the United States next week, so I just left him yesterday in Hong Kong, and he does understand Mega Me. Um, okay, so, but we, what I showed you was where to access information, for instance, Klaus Fogel and CCH, who has one opinion, versus Michael Edwards Kerr in your course materials, totally different opinion. You have a totally different perspective of Klaus Fogel in your course materials. You also have SCAR, S-K-A-A-R, and Huston, H-U-S-T-O-N, their course materials um, under your IVLS stuff. And, uh, and so you have different perspectives on the definition of permanent establishment. But what we're going to be talking about are the generalities, that is, the common features of all the perspectives. Um, on some things people don't disagree. Let me give you an example of disagreement so you can see what I'm talking about. Last time I spoke about time as a factor. What does permanent mean? And we looked at what permanent doesn't mean. It's easy to start with the definition by saying what it isn't. Well, we know that permanent wasn't infinity. Um, that permanent, uh, no, that permanent could mean infinity. Um, but that in one viewpoint, uh, we even saw that permanent could mean, well, we were breaking it down into how many days and in length of time and, and looking at different words that were used in the commentary versus the treaty. Uh, 
and then we went and looked at uh, at a few other treaties to see what language they used in the language in Klaus Vogel's book and permanent did not only mean infinite but when we deciphered it it didn't mean by example a month or two months if, if one goes into the uh, if one continued to analyze the track that we were on that day However, to get more specific right now as an example of disagreement, in counting days, whether it's for days of residency to determine whether an individual is taxable, 183 days, or to determine whether a, an office or an operation, a business management operation, has become a permanent establishment under the criterion of time, we have to look at, we have to count days. So here's disagreement. Does a day equal a day? What does that mean? I land in San Diego yesterday at 11.59 p.m. Does yesterday count as a day? I was only one minute from midnight, which would have been today. Is yesterday a day? In some countries, yesterday is a day. In fact, in the United States, yesterday is a day. In the United Kingdom, yesterday is not a day. What if I had arrived at 12.01 a.m. yesterday? 12.01 a.m. Well, in the United States, if I'm there for one minute, there is, of course, an exception. The exception is medical, medical necessity exception. The, if I'm there for one minute during the day, that day counts. However, by example, in England, if I'm there for 23 hours and 59 minutes, it doesn't count. The day of arrival and the day of departure are not counted for UK purposes of determining residency of an individual, taxation of individual's income, permanent establishment. Why are you using local rules? Uh, I'm giving you an example, however, the treaties are going to refer to time and to day, but they don't define time and day. They're going to leave what constitutes a day open. And so I'm giving you examples of two countries that don't agree in the calculation or in the definition of what is a day. However, you've brought up a good point, Hale. Can I use the local law definition? Let's say it's the United States. Truly, the answer is no. I have to use the international law definition of what counts a day. And how do I find the international law definition of what counts a day? I need to go look, not at U.S. jurisprudence, not at U.K. jurisprudence, if it's a U.K.-U.S. dispute. I must go look at a combination of jurisprudence from all the countries in the world, something like what Michael Edwards Kerr does with his book. The reason being, if there was agreement between the two definitions, synergy, one, you wouldn't need a treaty on it. Two, where there's disagreement, you can't favor one system over the other, and in particular, the reason the treaty is to create certainty and to protect the rights of the foreign taxpayer. You don't need a treaty to protect the rights of the domestic taxpayer because the domestic taxpayer is under domestic jurisdiction. You never have a treaty issue. Protecting the foreign taxpayer's rights and creating certainty means that the local jurisdiction is giving up either jurisdiction at tax or giving up its perspective, its viewpoint, of definition of how a term should be uh, 
applied. Um, and now it's not giving it up by the same token to the other state. It's not giving the other state jurisdiction to define its tax law. Um, it's only giving up the right of the ability to collect tax. So we have to look at something else. This is, of course, just my opinion. Klaus Vogel would disagree. Um, I think in my favor you would have uh, Professor Martin Edwards from Erasmus University. He would be an agreeer on this. Um, John Avery Jones would probably agree with this also. Always look away from the domestic source country's rules because that's the reason a treaty exists in the first place, because there's disputes between, conflicts between, overlapping definitions between the two countries that are coming to a treaty, and the treaty's purpose is to create a neutral situation amongst the parties, and the best way to create a neutral situation is to ignore both parties' stance and look for the public international law, which is through the practice of states. The practice of states can be determined through a review of all the case law that exists generally speaking, amongst the OECD um, on that issue. And, uh, and so to determine the amount of days, or when you calculate a day for the amount of days, such as, is the day I land a day? In the UK case, it's not. In the US case, it is. Um, the day that I set up my, that I land and set up my exhibition under the exhibition article or the exhibition paragraph for permanent establishments does that count toward my time as setting up a permanent establishment so we have to look at the jurisprudence which lucky for y'all you have plenty of access to through all your databases um, so looking at my little simple diagram here on the board resident and source state business income The source state has a right to tax business income as long as it is connected with a permanent establishment. So my source state wants to have the most liberal interpretation of permanent establishment that it may in the most cases that it may in the most cases collect the tax that it would normally collect if there wasn't a treaty protecting the right of collection for the home office sitting in the winter state, the resident state. If we just look at the U.S. rule for a moment, the U.S. rule is a very catch-all type rule. I mentioned this last time, last class. The U.S. rule states, if you have an office in the U.S., then everything in the U.S. becomes attributable to that office. Let me repeat that to make sure we all understand, because it's different from other countries' definitions. If you have an office in the U.S., so whatever office means for U.S. tax purposes, an office in the U.S. is very liberally interpreted to catch a lot of things. So for sure, and there's plenty of case law on that, so for sure, if you have a, a telephone number in the U.S., big problems. You have a bank account and a telephone number in the U.S., there's just no explanation of what, of, of, uh, you're not going to be able to get away from this office definition. So if you have an office in the U.S., then all your U.S. income becomes connected to that office. All your U.S. income becomes connected. Now, this is very different than we're going to see in the treaty definition. So, U.S., if office, then all 
all U.S. income becomes taxable to that office. So I'm writing that at the bottom of your board. I'll contrast it with England because I have the English treaty open and so forth. So we'll look at the English domestic rule also to see where our conflict will lie if we didn't have a treaty. If you have office, all income taxable. All income from a from a US source, of course. Now it's taxable at the corporate income tax level as a branch, so we call it branch tax. It's called branch profits tax. But branch profits tax isn't truly correct because you could have a branch loss and you're still taxing a branch but the branch is net operating losses which someday will be used to offset your profits in the future. You have branch profits tax and then you have branch withholding tax. When the branch distributes its profits to, by example in my case, I'm going to be using the UK, so the UK head office, the UK HO. So we have our first level of tax, our, our corporate rate, let's say 35. We have our second level of tax, the withholding tax, 30%, as if it was a dividend. So all the U.S. is doing here is saying that a branch and a subsidiary are going to be treated in the exact same way. A branch will be taxed at the rate that a corporation, that is a subsidiary, would be taxed. And its distribution of profits will be taxed the same way that a distribution of dividends will be taxed. Now, that's the theory, of course, the U.S. plays a game just like anyone else. It's actually worse to be taxed as a branch in the U.S. It's worse. There's a legal theory why the U.S. does it this way, but if you're a subsidiary, that is, you're a company, you're allowed to deduct your interest payments that you pay to your parent company. But if you're a branch, you're not allowed to deduct your interest payments you pay to your head office. The legal theory behind that is and there's been lots of case law in the U.S., and particularly the Westminster case and the Barclays case. You might want to write those cases down if you ever do U.S., U.K. work or any banking work, especially you, Renee, you're in banking. You want to know, back of your hand, the Westminster and the Barclays case, especially since you're a U.K. bank. Um, the issue was, under the treaty, as a permanent establishment, the U.S., said, the IRS said, we're not going to allow your permanent establishment to deduct interest that it pays to its head office. Well, if the head office is making a loan available for money it got from the UK market to a US company via the US branch, it's in a really bad situation where all the interest the US branch collects is not offset by the interest it pays. So the U.S. has super inflated the profits at the U.S. level to collect more tax. Very unfair. But the th legal theory behind that is the U.S. says, it's called single entity theory. Single entity theory. Write that down. Single entity theory. S-E-T. Single entity theory says... The left hand can't pay the right hand, i.e., if you're the same company, that is, a branch is the same legal entity as its head office, that's certainly true, then how can you pay yourself interest? You can't loan yourself money, says the U.S. Well. That allows a lot of tax planning for U.S. companies outside the U.S. That's another reason that the U.S. leaves that in place. Um, 
It especially helps on controlled foreign corporation planning and uh, another course another time. But there's a reason that Congress doesn't change that besides helping the U.S. collect more revenue from banks. Um, there, it allows a lot of games in the offshore world um, so that companies can reduce their controlled foreign corporation tax liability. Now, I've described to you the U.S. situation. Let me describe to you the domestic U.K. situation. The domestic U.K. situation is very similar to the permanent establishment article itself. The U.K. situation says if you have an office in the U.K., but it defines an office constrictively. It's not defined as, oh, because you have a number in London. Oh, because you have a bank account in England. No. They require more contact and more substance for that office. And, by example, if that office is only a marketing office, by example, like a bank rep office or investment fund rep office, where all you have is a bunch of documentation, folders, brochures to pass out, the UK ignores it. It's not an office for tax purposes. In the US, that's a taxable office. You have a phone number, you have a bank account, somebody sits there, boom, you have an office. Any income you make in the US is taxable. Taxable through that office 35%, pay 30% withholding tax on the amount that should be distributed to the head office. In the UK, that's not the case. Now, we have the permanent establishment article. So, the permanent establishment article, if you have a PE in the source state, then the source state is allowed to tax the business income that is associated with that PE. This is different from the US rule. The US rule, have an office, all income in the US immediately becomes attributable to that office, pay 35% then 30. But for the permanent establishment definition, if you have a permanent establishment, then the income taxable to that permanent establishment is that income which is associated, or we could say effectively connected. Associated, effectively connected with that permanent establishment. What about other income? That's taxed under the relevant article. An example, let's say that you have a permanent establishment that for a for a bank and that permanent establishment is deeply involved and signed a contract to place a loan in the country. The interest associated with that loan, that is the interest associated with the activities of that permanent establishment, that branch, that rep office, are fall within Article 7, business income. And Article 7 says that the source state may tax that income. Be aware, of course, correspondingly, under the credit article, the resident state may also tax that income. That income is associated to a head office. However, the resident state, the winner state, must give a tax credit. for the taxes paid on that income in the source state. Now, in my example, the bank with the interest, let's say the bank also owns two subsidiaries in the resident country. If we were applying the U.S. rule, the dividends 
would very likely fall into the activities of my branch and thus I'd be double taxed on that income I'd be taxed at the branch level I'd be taxed at the branch withholding level before my head office got the, the income however under the permanent establishment article unless the dividends were effectively connected unless they correspond to the activities or result of the activities of the permanent establishment they do not fall under article 7 then I have to look at the article that divvies up the right that decides who has jurisdiction to tax dividends and that article is article 10 we're not going to go to article 10 today now before I go onward let us go look at some of the databases that will help give us further information upon permanent establishments the first place we're going to start CCH and I'm going to have to clear my screen go into their proxy sir not the proxy VPN virtual private network or choose when you choose CC that uh, uh, memorize the password clicked on the tab that said international tax research on international and in the middle of the page is so I'm looking at the explanatory notes on the Klaus's that would fall within the screens quickly Um, permanent establishment, if we see section two, that is paragraph two, the term is permanent establishment includes especially, I already said this last time, but just one more time. The term permanent establishment includes, take out the word especially for a second, scratch that word as if it wasn't there. If it only read the term permanent establishment includes, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, if that's all it said, that list is all inclusive. That means that list excludes 
anything beyond A, B, C, D, and F. In fact, it's not even similarity or functionally equivalent words. If a statute or a treaty says the blah includes, the blank, the term, the da 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 includes and does not use an expansive modifier. Okay, in this case it says especially. By using especially, it opens up that this list is exemplary. This list is exemplary. Exemplary meaning that there are like or the functionally equivalent types of business associations or practices or activities that may fall within the concept of permanent establishment. The real question you have to ask yourself, the real big issue here is, must other types of business activities, and here our list we have six types of business activities. Workshop, oil or gas well, or other extraction of natural resource, office, branch, place of management. The real issue is, does the business activity that you're examining, must it be the functional equivalent of one of these six, that is, must it still fit within the pigeonhole of these six words, like kinds? Or is this list an example of activities and other types of activities could be added, such as G, H, I? So, is another type of activity, are these examples of types of activities of which other types of activities may fall into? So you don't create a new H-I-J, it has to fit within A through F itself. That would be a constrictive view of the word especially. A liberal view of the word especially would be the H-I-G approach, H-I-J. That is, that there are other types of business activities that, uh, that may be um, that may be uh, added on to this list. So now I'm pointing out the list here. I'm going to go back to my Fogel uh, commentary. First, okay. Five, two. Well, we all all know that from construction. We've talked about this many. It does not seem to be fit. Or is it of which
he's incorrect. But it contains an oil well. What mission? Okay, it merely contains such facilities. A liberal interpretation of what? Does it also apply liberally? Exceptions. Information collection. The first first hail. The phrase permanent establishments definition and three to see three and number four we have our to you then inhale is do we live with definitions the words the terminology used in Tibor we have two Here, number four. the term PE shall be deemed not to include. So now we have A, B, C, D, E, F, another six types of business operations, not facilities, business operations, that if you are undertaking in the source country, the treaty specifically states, deemed, specifically states, and it must be, because we have the word shall, the other country does not have any leeway on this, shall, deemed specifically, not to include, i.e., the source state country may not impose jurisdiction to tax, may not collect tax upon these following six types of business activities. Do we liberally apply okay I'm reading your uh, the phrase permanent establishment 
the totality of Article 5 applies to the book. Hale Stewart says yes. Um, make this window bigger now. I gotta open up my big window. It's, it's hard for me to read um, what you've written. So I'm blind. Okay. Article part, paragraph four. The term place of business covers any premise, facilities, or installations used on carrying on the business. Paragraph 4.1. The mere fact that an enterprise has a certain amount of span at its disposal, which is used for this. Yes, I'm part of the typos. Um, yes. Hale's comment is going to the liberalist construction here that one should porting the section this activity. This could go on or seven with constrike the original six or constrike seven. The side of that argument is be this way. Liberal permanent establishment unfinite. Then we view what are the Deemed under happy to have a liberally up A through standing my list to, for instance, G. Graph for the except supply activities. Well, first of all, all just language wise, you have all these different languages in the world. Right now, a little low. Cells. But uh, so there's plenty of scope. Just now the back on on Fogo, which is up on your. Uh, take the expedition this list could have that 
H, I, J, and, and so on. to point out Fogel for you though is the cases that Fogel brings up you need public establishment Um, it's best to come prepared available and we through the law. Need to call the their general counsel. They're gonna have to call their counsel. And their counsel may not know what the hell you're talking. Have to call to train. Of course. Dutch Nether case and the Harad with a Dutch case. We see the he refers. This is not the. Uh, and another. Case at the Supreme Court level. He also tech. In this next next section paragraph of his own and the It has a more now that you use analyst quickly because. Commentary. We opened up for the OECD. News archive.
I don't have to do this. I can go to my Worldwide Tax Daily or International Tax Journal, which is just a collection of the Worldwide Tax Daily on a weekly basis, and it's mailed out in paper form. But I'll search by country. I'm going to search for the term permanent establishment. get my country by country case law to see what case law is out there on PE now while that's processing I could go to checkpoint except my checkpoint expired um, Let's see. I have to guess my password. I'm going to guess it's TGSL. One, two, three, four. Reset. No. Seemingly correct. See if tax analyst has finished searching. No, tax analyst is searching. So back to my checkpoint. Under checkpoint, I want to go to. I'm going to research. I'm going to go to my table of contents, International Tax Library, and hell, I'll just search all the international stuff. Now I'm going to type in my keyword. I'm in an establishment. Tax analyst should be finished finding permanent establishment. This is invalid. Permanent. I don't think it's invalid. Spell it wrong. Yes, it is. Oh, way too many documents. Hong Kong. Signed tax agreement with Luxembourg. And, uh, by the way, for those who like treaty developments, here's a weird treaty that was just signed. The Isle of Man has signed a full double taxation agreement with the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands of Denmark. Now, the reason Isle of Man has done that is because it doesn't want to sign TIAs anymore. It only wants to sign double tax agreements. So uh, it needs to be able to state that it has signed double tax agreement with somebody, and that somebody is the Faroe Islands. For those of you who are treaty watching, that just happened. Um, 
you can probably get that treaty here off tax analysts. I've not looked myself. We we're just having a big laugh about it the uh, other day. Um, anyway, I would scroll down my tax analyst list and uh, and, uh, and and find any treaties that are. I'm sorry, find any uh, cases that are reported, obviously in English. Um, by example, here's Australian issues statement on GE Capital Finance decision. Swiss residents subject to tax in Australia. ATO says finished fishermen's income tax not assessable in Australia. Here's an Indian case, August 21st, 2007, Canadian firms profits from Indian. Okay, so you get the point. So. I would um, I'd go down and look at my other cases. I can obviously get more a refined search by permanent establishment management office or something like that. So I don't have to find 1,200 links to go scroll through. Um, here's a lot of Indian court cases, Australian court, Indian court, Indian court of ports, tax liability of Singapore company, um, and so on. Okay, having said that, I'm going to close out my tax analyst. Third permanent over 10,000 hits in my checkpoint. Way too many. I would need to bring down the uh, edit the search. I'm going to try with just my quotation marks again. It won't let me do it. Okay. typing in permanent establishments already there, put quotation marks around it, and after it I'm putting the word case, C-A-S-E, -S -S -E. case, like case law. It's going to, at least it's going to reduce the amount of hits from 10,000 to something less than 10,000. But case might not be the best way because a lot of country systems don't call cases cases. It's like tribunal decision. Really I should probably have typed the word decision in there. Let's just see. I'm going to go look at one place to see if case was a good search term versus the word decision. And I can look at IBFD Worldwide Tax Treaties, you see me clicking on a, I think this is just going to be mentioning the word permanent establishment in the treaties. It is. It is not recognizing the word case. Oh. It is. It is using the word case. The word case arise, is in treaties. Um, using Boolean search terminology, I would need to make sure that case fell within the same paragraph as the word permanent establishment. Um, but under my IBFD daily tax news service, at October October 11th I'm choosing one at random and if it doesn't work I'm going to replace it with the word case 
case. Okay. However, it's not a case of what. I need to construct my search. to edit the search. My search. And uh, if you modify my search, that you always do within Lexis and Westlaw is to say that the word case all within a paragraph that permanent establishment falls within. And um, I'm trying to remember how to do that myself. I think it's a P. I don't know if it comes before or after. There's one way to find out. Otherwise, I can use my thesaurus query tool, and that will remind me. Unless somebody else reminds me. Mark LaRue, slash 50. That's it, yeah. Well, within paragraph, that does seem to work, but... Uh, World Trade Executive Publications. I'll click on that and see if uh, we get a case result. U.S. International Tax Strategies. I'm going to click on, uh, actually, I'm going to click on the European one above it. We'll click on 2007. There are three results for 2007 so far. We'll click on September's issue. Something about Poland. It does not seem like my search. Better to use the word to say. This over and over the word used in a different context. Searches. And if you're doing a thorough search, then you, I guess you need to make two separate searches when using both. On the other hand, looking at the left-hand <coughs> side of my screen, Tribunal Rules on Taxability under India-U.S. Treaty. So, sometimes case does pull what I want to find, so it finds tribunal rulings. Interpretation for Hong Kong-China Double Tax Agreement. You'll see that on the left-hand side of your screen. I'll just circle it in yellow so that everyone sees the exact same thing I'm looking at. And, uh, and there's the uh, interpretation of the Hong Kong thing. So sometimes case does seem to be the right word. You would also want to use the word decision. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, close out checkpoint. Here I am in my Westlaw, well, I think I'm in Westlaw, course. So, okay, that's my slides. Here I am in uh, Westlaw. 
uh, in the course. But Westlaw and Lexis are both also interesting search tools. With Westlaw, I'm clicking on the upper left-hand tab for research. And you've been working with uh, your Thesis One professor, Gordon Russell, uh, hopefully on, on your research techniques and so forth for Westlaw and, and yada yada. And of course you have 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 day a year support with Westlaw. Um, and you can use that support online or by calling them. Just last night, I was using that support online. They are really on the ball. I was online using Westlaw at uh, midnight or a little after San Diego time. So 2 in the morning Westlaw time in Egan, Minnesota. And within three minutes, they were online with me, found this new database that they have for congressional records, and, uh, and found the uh, 1954 commentary. I was looking for, for some senator. And uh, so it's always available. Um, so here in Westlaw, I would want to go to my uh, tax topics. My Westlaw is working very slow for some reason. Um, if it is working at all. It's not working, it's just frozen. However, what you would do is you would continue on by looking at your tax topics as you probably already do now. Uh, or you could look cases and you would follow up with uh, for instance, go try and look at international material cases. I can't do this. My Westlaw is frozen. I'm going to close it. Oceana. the treaties themselves. I just wanted to remind everybody of that database so I have it open on your screen. Um, Oceana just doesn't have the case law yet. used Oceana to pull up my example. I said I would do it anyway. Um, again, I'm clicking on primary subject, taxation, country list. I'm clicking on country list. blocking the pop-up, which did not block earlier, but it doesn't matter. I will, uh, I can just type in UK or US into countries, parties, and, uh, no, there's my pop-up, which just took a bit of time. I'm scrolling down my pop-up using my mouse scroll. For some reason, I'll just tell you this little secret. I don't want to click on the scroll bar itself. If I click on the scroll bar, it makes the pop-up window disappear. And thus, I just want to scroll down with my scroll scroll button, scroll circular wheel on my mouse. Then I click on UK. I'm going to click on country list again. I'm clicking on country list again. It's going to give me uh, the same list I saw before. And I'm going to click on U.S. and then I'm going to get all the and then I'm going to get the U.K. U.S. treaties that have been in place from those that are out of commission to those that are in force today or newly negotiated. 
However, it is taking far too long for my pop-up. There it is. Scrolling down. Well, it didn't like that. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and search with my United Kingdom. And once I'm in the United Kingdom, I'll have to do a scroll down to United States and choose that treaty. So on your screen, you see the Oceana page now. I'm clicking the uh, my next arrow button, and it's going to, oh, uh, there it is, United Kingdom, USA. Convention, avoidance of double taxation. Look at the annotation above. The annotation above tells you the previous history of the treaty. primary change in the revised convention is the inclusion of pension funds and teachers that were not there before. However, what I'm pointing out for you is the actual uh, PE article, so we're just going to scroll down to number five. And pulls almost check out how many months does it state for a building site those that follow the UN convention will be six months versus those that follow the OECD which will be 12 months and how liberal is its list of exceptions of what you're allowed to do And in number F, not all treaties contain a number F that says the maintenance solely for, the, for any combination of the activities above. So number F is one that says you can do A, B, C, D, E all together as long as they're all ancillary. Ancillary or pre pre preparatory character for the business. Not every treaty has an F. Treaties, if you do B and C, it doesn't fall within the exception rules. Modern treaties, you can do B, C, D, E, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm closing out Oceana, showing you where you can find something basically. So where, we, where can we find our cases? We can find our case CCH. I'm looking at them right now. For my treaties analysis. I want to be able to uh, click international tax.
And here in international tax, besides You know what I'm talking about. That will not give you a case. You will find other cases mentioned in. By example, Pasquale Pistone's empty communities. Instead of recently come out. Um, your, uh, Doing burn and rod. And the uh, U.S. model income tax treaty for that has been. Regardless, they're not sent from the previous model. You can go to the model. Tax analysts, because remember. Articles using tax AFD on those on those changes. Okay. You have to access to tax notes, as we already saw with tax analysts, but you could do your search here in CCH. And um, and you have CCH's own international tax journal, which I'm clicking on now. Oh, I should have clicked on them both, but uh, regardless. Um, and you would, uh, you could do a search on them, but I'll click on global transactions if I wanted and I can go through the different I can go through the different uh, see here's fall 2006 I'm just going to open it up for you just so you can see what type of articles are in there. And now you see. But if I wanted to do a search, there at the top of my screen, I would do click the, click the, uh, like if I went to International Tax Journal, clicking that, I would click International Tax, I click Global Transactions. I go to the search bar at the very top of my screen. I'm going to type in the word permanent establishment and click search I could have typed in the word case or decision or tribunal and, um, and then I would go down and look at my uh, and see what cases there were okay I'm going to close CCH. How you're going to analyze the list of what constitutes a permanent establishment, place of management branch, and so forth, where you're going to read your materials to determine when the loser state that is the sex the business profits on Brian we're going to look at the next of the exceptions under the tax plan course everybody for the course is going by we're also going to look at the, I'll call it the way, but it's not, it's the civil law way 
of exempting the taxation and the income associates or in another country um, and how this all works for tax planning and how it works very effectively for tax planning and we don't have to, I always use Holland as, a, as, a, as an example, so we'll use another country, let's say Austria. Uh, we'll choose Austria as an example because Austria right now is getting a lot of press on how it's a very effective tax planning state. And whereas Holland used to be the easiest country to get tax rulings from, Austria is even easier. Because Holland has 15 million people and Austria only has 8. And Austrian tax officials actually like to drink coffee more than Dutch tax officials, which means that you can sit around the cafe and have a discussion about what you want to do, and as long as you're open and honest and you do not lie about your facts, and your facts do not change, and they eventually shake your hand and you draw up your proposal to have an official uh, 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 letter ruling on from the Austrian officials, it's good as gold. They only get angry when you lie and you uh, and you hide the facts, or you set in under one set of facts and you change the facts, and then they're quite brutal. Okay, so we'll talk about the non the exceptions, that is, the non permanent establishment rules under the uh, fourth paragraph or fourth section of the OCD model, and we'll talk about them also in the context of international tax planning, taking advantage of my, my tax-exempt permanent establishments in another country under civil law. Okay, so that's all I wanted to get through today. I will stop showing my desktop. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and ask. Are there any questions? Where are the recorded lectures? Uh, only one or two of the recorded lectures have come out. Um, I've given them to IT, but they're mainly useless. I, uh, I'll give you an example of about one of the two-hour treaty lectures, only 30 minutes of it came out, so you have to listen to the hour and 30 minutes of non-audio to hear the last 30 minutes of audio. What I am doing is I'm buying a $1,000 program uh, today from Adobe that's supposed to record better than the, than the mega meeting record function. And um, 